Okay, so we've defined the mind. The mind then is the process that regulates energy and information flow in this view. The brain is the structural mechanism that shapes that flow. It's very important, but it's not the whole thing. And then relationships are what? What's a relationship that we have with one another? It's the way you share or exchange energy and information flow. Right. So in many ways, this entire triangle is a triangle of energy and information flow. And the difference between these two is simply this. I mean, everything, as you know from Einstein, is you know, energy. Even mass is energy, very dense, condensed energy, mass, very predictable. But once you get closer to subatomic levels, of course, you don't apply just Newtonian aspects of mass, you apply quantum mechanics aspects of mass, you realize that things are more about probabilities, right? And in many ways, energy and information flow are at that small level, doesn't make them less important, it just makes them, um, uh, bless you, makes them flow by different properties, not Newtonian properties. So when you get to that level of reality, you have to apply probability theory. And so I have another book coming out next month called The Mindful Therapist, which applies quantum mechanics to this whole notion of contemplative practice for the, the reader to actually experience it. But the point here is that in relationships, as we're sharing energy and information flow, we need to understand that we can influence the probability of things. So if you look at the book called Connected by Nicholas Christakis, you'll find this notion of what he calls invisible forces that literally influence us three degrees away from us. So if you start doing things to eat better, let's say, or to be kinder, or let's say even say promote positive climate change behavior, according to Christakis's view, and it's a fantastic book, you will influence your friend's friend's friend. And so relationships have these probabilistic influences in ways that aren't magical, they're not mystical, they're not you know, um, metaphysical. They're literally the way behavior is perceived, and not only behavior, and here's the amazing thing, intention. We have neural mechanisms, this whole thing that you've probably heard about called mirror neurons, that are designed to detect the intention of another person. Right? We are incredibly social creatures, and intention means a lot. But again, if you're not making maps of the importance of climate change, you're not going to have any intention even for climate change. It'll be irrelevant. The person will be climate blind if they aren't making neural maps of the importance of the future so that we can do something now to make a better outcome for future generations. So relationships are basically the sharing of energy and information flow, including the perception of intention, Mind is the regulation, brain is the structural mechanism. Now, <clears throat> once you get this triangle, there are all sorts of things you can do. So in the book, The Mindsight Book, you'll see things for personal transformation. For you, what I would like to learn from you is if there's any way that this might be useful to actually um, try to look at how you can motivate people to change the way they function. So what I'm going to do now is just talk about two aspects of neuroanatomy that I think are vital for climate change issues. Um, but let me check with Rebecca about my timing and, and when, because I know we're going to have questions and response. So uh, could you wrap in five minutes? Yeah, I can, I can certainly try. So let's do this. Uh, but that means I will, that's my intention. <laughs> I'll share my intention with you. So let me, <laughs> what's that? And you'll, you'll monitor and I'll modify. There we go. So we'll have a collective mind. You can see where it happens like that, right? So here's what I want to just make sure that we, that we take home these following things. This is a whirlwind in neuroanatomy. Okay, this is uh, take home point number five, which goes like this. This person, and, and if you put your thumb in the middle of your hand and put your fingers over the top, this would be a good model of the brain. And here's the face. All right, so try this out. Put your thumb in the middle, put your fingers over the top, and this is your model of the brain, and this is your crash course in anatomy, okay? Your wrist represents the spinal cord, and that's coming up through the neck, of course, and it's going to bring all the data from the interior of the body around your intestines, your heart, all this stuff is coming up a layer called lamina one. Lamina one data is the key to how the body brings its wisdom 
up into the brain that's in the skull. So that's the first stage of this flowing energy and information flow we're talking about. So all the ways you have a heartfelt feeling, I need to help the planet, you are opening yourself up to lamina one. You just feel it. This is what I need to do. This is why I'm coming to the Garrison Institute now. You feel it. Okay, so it comes up to lamina one. Now, all that stuff from the body, the first part of the brain, if you lift your thumb up, lift your fingers up, lift your thumb up, is this part here, which is called the brain stem. Okay, and the brain stem would be represented in your palm. And lamina one sends some twigs over there, and it starts doing some basic heart regulation, intestine regulation, regulation of the respiration. Okay, but also besides those bodily regulation functions, very, very important for climate change is the fight, flight, freeze response embedded here in the brainstem. This is the old reptilian brain, 300 million years old, very, very old, is a basic source of motivational drives that Jacques Pankcep talks about in a book called Affective Neuroscience. <clears throat> and these basic functions in your palm here have incredible importance about whether someone's going to stay present in awareness or not. And so we're going to talk in a moment about something called personal distress and the difference between, and I'll just outline this, this is take on point number six, personal distress versus empathic concern. Very, very different. And depending on how we work out people approaching climate change, you'll get people withdrawing in fear or dread and saying, forget that, I don't want to think about it. Or they'll stay present with empathic concern. Okay, so we're starting in the brainstem with the fight, flight, freeze response. Okay, now if you put your thumb back over the top, we'd have two thumbs for this to be a perfect model, but most of us just have one. The, um, the <clears throat> next area we're going to talk about, we'll just make a circle there, is called the limbic area, which has your old friend, the amygdala everybody talks about, which is usually overrated, but this limbic area developed about 200 million years ago. Okay, so it's a newer part of the brain. And this is the area that does a bunch of different things, but the, for our purposes, it's working with the body and the brainstem to create emotions, number one. It is vital for climate change because the second thing it does is it evaluates the significance of incoming sensory data. And by evaluate, what I mean is it, number one says, should I pay attention to this or not? When I go to the store, if I'm going to pay attention, you know, using those gadgets you have now or even just thinking about whether this is a green product or not, you know, my, my limbic area is going to make all the difference. If it evaluates, I'm going to pay attention to this, it's got to be a part of a whole system that says that's important. So the first is pay attention. The second part of the evaluation process is, is this good or bad? And then the third is I uh, elaborate on that appraisal to figure out what I'm going to do with my behavior. So when you're talking about behavioral change, you've got to understand how the body, the brainstem, and the limbic area are working beneath consciousness, which is a cortical outcome. We haven't gotten to the cortex yet. All that stuff happens automatically, flowing of energy through ancient circuits, where if a person is filled with personal distress, the limbic area will say, get away from that. So you can do studies, for example, in social neuroscience where you say, here's a person who's been let's say, going through unbelievable pain, and you say, imagine, what it's lo imagine you in that position. So a person has empathic concern, but then they're filled with personal distress, and they pull away from helping. This is what all the studies show. They don't help. Then you, the second condition is you say, OK, here's a person being hurt. I want you to focus on what it's like for that person. Then the person has empathic concern, but very little personal distress, and they help. So both situations which seem so similar, imagine yourself in that situation versus focus on the, what you think is going on with that person, totally different behavioral outcomes, even though they seem almost identical.